Hi, everyone. Welcome all to this new episode of the lockdown. Uh, and I'm very, very privileged and happy today to be joined by the person who has written my favorite book of the year. He's a professor of management at Wharton, and his name is Mauro Guigen, and he has written 2030, a book all of you should read. Um, Despite the, um, the very optimistic and ambitious subtitle, which is how today's biggest trends will collide and reshape the future of everything, the book, believe me, does what it says in the cover. It actually covers the main trades, it connects trends today, it connects them and makes predictions that seem simultaneously um, feasible and likely and counterintuitive, and it will really reshape the way you think about the near future. So, Mauro, how are you today? I'm feeling uh, really good. It's, uh, uh, you know, a beautiful day today in Philadelphia, where I am. So thank you so much for inviting me to your podcast. Okay, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Um, I think I probably read the book twice, even though it came out recently, both in my iPad and in physical copy, and I'm going back to the notes all the time. Um, you know, so despite the fact that I have almost memorized it, I want to start giving you the chance to provide a brief summary. What is it about and how did you think about the book? So the book is about uh, the next 10 years. Uh, and the idea here is that uh, by the year 2030, uh, the world is going to be almost unrecognizable because there's so many things going on. And I track essentially three types of trends. Uh, so some have to do with population, and I'm sure we're going to get into that later. Others have to do with the rise of emerging markets. And then lastly, with uh, the use of technology, the increasing use of technology um, when we play, when we learn, when we work, when we shop, and when we entertain ourselves. And uh, essentially, as you said, I mean, the key point here is not to understand each of these trends separately, but rather to look for the interconnections, to look for the ways in which they are interrelated. Mm -hmm. um, I know you spent a lot of time researching the book, six or seven years, I think you said, either in the book or another podcast. Why did you pick 2030 as the year? So I started, as you said, about seven years ago doing research on this. I was making presentations about uh, the future of consumer and financial markets, and I was detecting that people were a little bit lost as to how, in what ways um, they could make sense out of all of the change in the world. And so three years ago, I decided finally to start writing the book. And it came out, as you said, uh, earlier this year. And, um, you know, the point about 2030 is that by that year, uh, we're going to see some trends reach critical levels. We're going to reach tipping points uh, in terms of uh, population changes. Uh, for example, the, how important the population above the age of 60 will be as consumers in the world. Uh, or also about uh, money. So the fact that uh, more than half of the world's wealth will be owned by women. Uh, and also, I think uh, we're going to see the first uh, practical uh, realizations of uh, things such as cryptocurrencies. Um, so the year 2030 is when, according to my calculations, most of these trends will be reaching a critical level, will becoming, be becoming a tipping point. And that's why I chose that as the title for the book. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was fascinated and well, and first, you know, I'm happy you chose 2030. I feel there's so many books about predictions and people usually pick very distant, far remote days, probably because they're not going to be alive when that happens and we see that they were wrong, you know, so we can't <laughs> find them or we forgot about them. Uh, but I also saw you in a recent interview where, because you kind of had to add a postscript to the book. I assume you finished it just before the pandemic mm -hmm. and then you added the final kind of uh, epilogue or post trip on it. I asked somebody ask you what you would revise or change um, on the book because of COVID. And I think you said it's exactly the same, but I would have called it 2028. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I would change two things. So one is the title because um, you see this pandemic is different than other crises and the economic um, you know, consequences of it. It is a pandemic that accelerates pre-existing trends. So in other words, it doesn't reverse, it doesn't derail uh, those trends about technology adoption, about the rise of emerging markets, about population. What it does is it makes the future arrive faster. So instead of the year 2030, the calculations that I've made is that, you know, that future that I described in the book now because of the full effects of the pandemic, it's actually going to be arriving maybe a year to two years earlier. That's the first thing I would change. 
The second thing that I think uh, we need to rethink is the role of cities in the world. Uh, but to be more specific, perhaps mostly in North America and in Europe. Because as you know, as a result of the pandemic, a lot of people are reconsidering where they live. Uh, I don't think um, the growth of cities is going to slow down in Africa or in South Asia because it's still the attraction of the city is so great, right? And the opportunities. Uh, but in Europe and the United States, I could see how at least uh, some of the trend uh, becomes reversed in the near future. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's really interesting. You know, I just did my class, obviously, virtually at Columbia. And even though people have known that they are remote since March, uh, they haven't left New York. I also know a lot of people who are still continuing to pay expensive leases and rents, even though they can probably guess that over the next six or nine months, uh, they're not going to need to be in the city. Do you feel on cities, and you have a chapter on it that I want to go into a little bit deeper in a minute, but do you think on cities this will be a short-term change and then we revert to, even in America, big cities, expensive rents and people want to be where the action is? Well, I think the immediate impact of the pandemic has been, as you know, that cities, municipalities are facing a, a big fiscal crisis, right? So that's one big effect uh, that is being felt already. And that is going to have uh, consequences for the medium or long run, depending uh, here in the United States uh, on how much the federal government is willing to do, right, in terms of uh, helping cities get out of that problem. Now, when it comes to residents, uh, you see, I don't think that all of us who are the ones uh, of, uh, amongst us uh, who are privileged, like you and I, to be able to work from the home. I don't think we're gonna be working from the home 100% of the time because this is, it just gets too boring and we feel lonely and uh, so on and so forth. Um, so I think we're gonna to go towards a hybrid model of work for office work. So you, know, you spend a few days working from the home, you commute to the office uh, some other day. So then, you know, I, I think, uh, yeah, some people will make the calculation, well, I don't need to be as close to the office then. Uh, but quite frankly, for cities like New York, like LA, like Chicago, like Miami, the, the attraction goes well beyond that. And mm -hmm. when I ask my colleagues in the real estate department at Wharton, so they're the ones who know the numbers, mm -hmm. who understand supply and demand of housing and all of that, they're telling me that uh, within a couple of years, now that we have a vaccine, now that uh, you know, we seem to be um, you know, seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, it is quite likely that things will go back to um, uh, you know, levels of demand that we've seen for housing in, in, in downtown areas. In fact, as you know, the figures so far for real estate transactions in a place like New York look actually pretty good, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not that the prices are falling, it's not that there's no buyers. Um, so in other words, I think perhaps the effect on cities of this pandemic has been exaggerated Mm -hmm. But having said that, I think we need to monitor it uh, because uh, I don't think it's obvious that we're just going to go back to mm -hmm. the pre-pandemic normal. Mm -hmm. So maybe in the future, we'll do all the work at home, but go to the office to watch Netflix with friends and have <laughs> Zoom drinks or real person drinks there. You know, it's like a reversal. Uh, uh, perhaps the happy hour, the lunchtime. <laughs> exactly. uh, but there's also, remember, I mean, companies worry about coordination. And... Sometimes coordination from a distance amongst employees is difficult. And then the other issue, by the way, let's not forget this, Tomas, is cybersecurity. So companies uh, can uh, implement cybersecurity protocols at the office uh, because, you know, employees are constantly, you know, looking into databases of uh, mm -hmm. customers, uh, suppliers, employees. Uh, but if the employees are working from the home, then implementing those cybersecurity protocols becomes uh, so much more complicated. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, exactly. I was speaking to an HR director recently who said, I mean, you can't just shoot off to Patagonia and move there. There's insurance issues and cybersecurity, et cetera. And by the way, if everyone leaves and everyone can work from anywhere, we're going to hire cheaper workers somewhere else. So that's exactly, not very exactly. good for them either. Correct. But I think both things can happen at the same time. That is to say that we evolved towards hybrid models. But at the same time, you just mentioned it, we see the emergence for the first time of a truly global market for talent. Mm -hmm. um, so in other words, that a company in Singapore, maybe they want to add a 10th person to their marketing team and they could hire somebody in Europe and they could tell that new hire, you don't have to move to Singapore. You can work from Europe. 
right? Mm-hmm. So I don't think that's going to become the norm, but certainly we're going to start seeing that. And guess who's going to benefit? Uh, it's people with differentiated skills, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And of course, people without those skills may get hurt. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's do a little bit of a, an overview of some of the chapters and uh, dive a little deeper, starting with demography, if you're happy. And, you know, what are the main demographic trends and almost certain trends that we will see between now and 2030 that the average person in the West should be aware of, particularly of things that happen and are happening in China and Africa? Well, um, I'm sure that your listeners will have heard about the decline in the number of babies, the decline in the fertility rate. And the pandemic, by the way, accelerates that because young couples, when they see that there's economic uncertainty, that maybe they've lost their jobs or their wages are not going to go up, they will be postponing having babies. And the mere postponement, as you know, having the babies reduces the fertility rate. Uh, That's one uh, thing. The other thing, of course, is we're living longer and longer and longer as time goes by. But of course, uh, these two uh, trends, right? A uh, smaller number of babies over time and longer life expectancy, they're not distributed evenly around the world, right? In Europe, the United States, Japan, China, we've been below replacement level, below two babies per woman for 20, 30, even 40 years, right? Depending on the country. And uh, so in other parts of the world, like South Asia um, and especially Sub Saharan Africa, Uh, the average family size is still four or five children. So what we're going to see is something fundamental. And by the year 2030, my calculation is that Africa will be, for the first time, the second biggest region in the world in terms of population. And as you know, African economies are growing. The middle class is starting to grow, especially in the bigger cities. So Africa is, because of these population trends, going to become a very important part of the global economy. And by the way, that's why Chinese companies are investing so much money over there, right? So that's one set of changes. We can get into others. Uh, I'm sure you have other questions about population, but I think the rebalancing of the centers of gravity of population in the world, it's going to be a really important event uh, to watch over the next 10 years. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Let's talk a little bit about uh, immigration. You know, the, uh, there's a fantastic um, you know, review of trends and potential implications. Um, I think, you know, globalization is continuing to happen despite the notoriety and press that um, some governments or policies or political parties that uh, seem to run or rally against it uh, often get. Um, And we just talked about, you know, technology kind of uh, eroding or diminishing the boundaries of talents when you can hire people everywhere. But you also make the case that um, you know, of the of the economic impact or ROI that migrants and immigration will continue to have in the next 10 years. And I was reminded by, I think it was an estimate in The Economist and others have made it as well, probably that if you, if you abolished borders between political borders between countries, it would automatically add 78 trillion to the global economy or something like that. And, and yet we are not doing it. We still, it's still, and in some instances, harder and harder for people to go from A to B. Um, what are the main trends or changes that you expect to see between now and 2030 around immigration and particularly the economic impact? Well, look, over the last uh, few years, uh, even before the pandemic, I think we've seen a political backlash against uh, immigration, both in Europe and the United States. And I think uh, this is problematic on two fronts. I mean, one is that, as you know, It just so happens that the populations of Europe and the United States are aging very quickly. And you see, most immigrants tend to be of middle age. So they migrate when they are in their 20s or their 30s. And so orderly immigration, so I'm not saying complete open borders, but orderly immigration is something that would help these countries with rapidly aging populations rebalance their Uh, age structure, right, which would have very, very beneficial effects in terms of the viability of uh, the pension system, healthcare, and so on and so forth. But the second thing, you you, you mentioned something about the return on investment. Um, So immigration, I mean, every study I've seen, and certainly studies by the National Academy of Sciences here in the United States, conclude that immigrants have a net positive effect on the economy. Uh, Look, um, the percentage of immigrants who become entrepreneurs 
is much higher than the percentage of entrepreneurs among the general population. And that entrepreneurship comes in two kinds. I mean, you have the kind of entrepreneurship um, involved in uh, restaurants or dry cleaners and so on and so forth. But you also have the high tech, right? I mean, Google, Tesla, I mean, several of these absolutely amazing companies have been founded or co-founded by immigrants, right? I mean, this is really important to keep in mind. And then the other thing that is really important is that, you know, in spite of uh, all of those accusations by some politicians, the immigrant mindset is one of hard work. Mm -hmm. um, you see, immigrants, they want to do well in the destination country. It's just simply a lie, right? It's not true that immigrants come here to try to take advantage of the healthcare system or to take advantage of the pension system. That's not true. In fact, the net contribution of immigrants to uh, the IRS, to you know, the, uh, the Treasury, the US Treasury, is positive, right? Because most of them are of working age. Um, so uh, in other words, immigration has many economic benefits. But again, a complete 100% open door policy would be politically impossible and actually in practice very difficult to implement right away. I think what we need to have is a better system for attracting immigrants at, at different skill levels that are needed by the economy. Because you see, I am in touch with businesses all the time and companies are always complaining about the fact that they would like to hire more workers from abroad because they cannot find enough talent mm -hmm. here inside of the United States. And so if the companies feel that way, that certainly is something that if we do not allow them to hire, then the economy is going to suffer and then all of our standards of living are going to suffer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's quite, a, I mean, could, could it be because I, I'm sure there is some data on this, but at least anecdotally um, or commonsensically, we also see that um, in most instances, migrants uh, are more open-minded, more curious, more hungry and more driven. Could that be partly the result that it's difficult for people to migrate to a country? You know, so in other words, could it be that ironically the, it, the, system, the, the process becomes more Darwinian and then you select a little bit like if it's harder for women to become leaders, the ones that get there are more educated, more qualified and more competent. So could there be something of this operating as well? Of course. I mean, look, um, not everyone to begin with decides to migrate, right? So we know that the people who tend to be immigrants, right? I, I'm talking here about economic immigrants. Of mm -hmm. course, uh, there's also refugees uh, and uh, other people who are just uh, displaced by, by politics. But in the case of economic uh, immig uh, migrants, um, so the ones who own property in their respective home countries tend not to migrate, right? Um, so the others come in two kinds. The ones who say, let me migrate. You have at the one end, the highly educated immigrant, right? In many cases, they actually don't come here at first as an immigrant, they come to study, right? And then they stay. And then you have the economic uh, migrants who have very low levels of skill. Um, so now think about it. The American economy needs both of them, right? Uh, just to give you two factoids, I mean, most of the people who pick up certain agricultural crops in the United States are immigrants. 90% um, of the people who take care of the elderly in the United States in their homes are immigrants, and most of them women, by the way. Um, and, uh, you know, the other thing to keep in mind is that if the economy doesn't have the, the skills and the labor with the requisite skills that it needs, then we're going to be living in the end below our potential. Uh, so immigration has many benefits if it's channeled adequately. And uh, I think we all need to overcome these kinds of, um, you know, um, uh, just accusations about uh, uh, what immigrants do and all of the negative things that they bring with them, uh, which are, you know, simply not true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the gray economy. Um, you know, in the last, the last few years, people have been so obsessed with the subject of millennials, younger workers, and, you know, there's been often a celebration, often a kind of demonization of young people. Not many people have talked about uh, older workers and the aging population. And as we know, people are living a lot longer, having to stay active longer. What are the main changes or patterns that you predict for the gray, the so-called gray economy? I love that term, by the way. So uh, first, 
uh, the fact. The fact is that uh, by the year 2030, the population above the age of 60 is going to be the most important consumer segment. And you see, it has always been the case in the past that people in their 20s, people in their 30s were the most important consumer segment. And then here in the United States, on top of that, the population above age 60 owns 80% of the net worth. It's the highest percentage in the world. In most other Amazing. countries, it's like 60%. So that doesn't mean that everybody above the age of 60 is rich. Of course not, because that wealth is unevenly spread. But the consequence is very clear. The consequence is that companies will have no choice but to pay attention to the great consumer, right? Because otherwise they would be losing out on the largest market segment. And secondly, of course, really, really, really important implication is as you know, now we live longer. So somebody who turns 65, let's say, uh, in the United States, on average, that person has another 30 years to live, right? Which is an enormous amount of time. I mean, it's like another lifetime. So I think this is going to have another very important consequence, Thomas, which is that this old conception, which, by the way, goes back to the 19th century, that life proceeds in stages. First we play, then we learn, then we work, and then finally we retire. We're going to have to change that mindset because you cannot retire when you're 60 or 65. People today in that age group are in much better mental and physical way than people in the same age group 50 years ago. Um, a retirement, which is 30 years, is just impossible for all sorts of reasons, right? Mm -hmm. So I think uh, that we're going to go into a situation in which instead of people having three or four jobs, what we're going to see is that people will go through two or three different professional careers in their life. Because first they will do something for 25 years, then they will return to school to learn something else right? Depending on how technology or how knowledge changes. And then they will work another 20 years and then they will go back to school again and they will, you know, pursue another line of work. Uh, so I think it's very important to, for us to abandon that mindset in which life is all about first you're a child, then you're a student, then you are a worker, and then you are a retiree. That is no longer tenable it was in the past when people on average live 50 years, but now we're living on average 80 or 85. So that's, you know, it's a very different situation. It's one of, it's one of the specific barriers to overcome the stereotypes and prejudices that people might have still in the workplace. Uh, so ageism. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And look, a worker who is 60 or 65 has a key advantage, which is experience. And experience is very valuable. And again, if we have a way of taking that worker back to school for a year or two full time, right, then that worker can enjoy yet another career for the next 20 years and still be able to retire at some point and enjoy 10 years in retirement, right? Mm -hmm. what, what I think is it's, it's just uh, doesn't make any sense is to expect people to be in retirement for 30 years. That doesn't make mm -hmm. any sense whatsoever. Yeah. It's a great point about experience and expertise, right? Like contrary to pop popular belief, I think things are generally easier when you know what you're doing. So yeah, well, you, you know. remember the movie The Intern, right? Exactly, exactly. Uh, in the movie The Intern, uh, we saw precisely that dynamic and how Robert yeah. De Niro was Robert playing Niro. the role of a retiree who just couldn't, you know, like uh, do anything, uh, you know, to keep him busy at home. Yeah. So he decided to become an intern at a uh, local Brooklyn, I think, based uh, yes, technology, yes, yes. technology company, right? Yeah, with Anne Hathaway. It's a, it's a good movie. Hey, let's, let's, uh, you're, you're pretty optimistic about the future of women or for women. And I know you refer to some of the more depressing um, predictions by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that is going to take a long time. But in general, you think there's going to be great acceleration on gender equality and women empowerment and the impact and wealth, especially that they're going to own um, very soon. So can you talk a little bit to that? Yeah, so I'm, I'm actually of two minds on this and I reflect that in the book. So the optimistic side is precisely what you're saying, which is that women now in most countries in the world have better access to education. They can pursue their own careers and then doing so. They're having fewer babies. So they're making their money, they're uh, accumulating their own wealth. And, uh, you know, the difference on average that used to characterize the experience of men and women has become reduced. There is no question about it. Now, having said that, of course, there's discrimination still against women. I'm not denying that. But the other side here is that when you take a look at 
what's going on within that group that we call women, right? Which is half or a little bit more than half of the population. Uh, you have highly educated women who are doing incredibly well. We have women who have launched their own businesses. They're doing extremely well. But we also have women here in the United States, for instance, who have not been able to benefit from education, who have not become entrepreneurs, and they're performing jobs that pay very little. So I think uh, we're going to go into a world in which the differences between men and women are, are going to become smaller, right? However, the differences among women, right, or among men separately, right, they're going to become bigger. Because as you know, one of the key problems that we have is inequality, right? Inequality in the access to education, inequality in the access to jobs, inequality in pay, and all of these things. So uh, just to, 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 you know, some, some of your listeners may find this counterintuitive, but so men and women will become closer to one another on average, right? But at the same time, within each of the two groups, we're going to see more inequality, right? Uh, driven once again by this problem that we have in terms of access to uh, education, uh, access to jobs, and so on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's very interesting. And uh, um, so the inequality, or in a way, the unfairness uh, and the bias will be more evident as differences in education, competence, and talent continue to disappear or even shift in favor of women in many areas, right? When it comes to oh, education. Absolutely. Look, I mean, uh, there's this one, you know, um, statistic that I think um, is just very telling. Right now, as we speak, if you take a look at American households where there's a married couple, man and woman, what you see, so we have no, no uh, data on this, at least I don't, uh, for same-sex couples. But if you compare heterosexual couples married to each other, those households, in 41% of them, the wife makes more money than the husband. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, when you and I were growing up, Tomas, mm -hmm. that was not the case. All right. And the projection by the U.S. government is that by the year 2030, it will be more than 50% of those households, the wife will be making more money than the husband. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a big change from 50 years ago, right? That is a completely different world. Yeah, and certainly not the case still today in Buenos Aires. I don't know in Madrid, maybe, maybe you know. Or it's, in, things are changing. Things are changing. There. Things are changing, but I think the U.S. has always been uh, ahead in terms of the economic opportunities for women. Uh, by the way. Not in the world of politics, however. There's very few women in the U.S. Congress uh, or in the Senate, right? Uh, but there's more professional women who are pursuing their careers in business and in other walks of life here in the United States and in most other countries in the world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the next chapter is, and you have the wonderful and very famous quote by John Lennon from Imagine, Imagine No Possessions, is the one that I found the most counterintuitive of the predictions and the trends, you know, that... Uh, Historically, we've always tried to um, signal our status and communicate our worth through our possessions. And of course, that's especially true, you know, if you go to the emblematic kind of symbols of capitalism through the 60s, 80s, big car, maybe now smartphones or Apple's new headphones that cost $500, you know. But you're saying in the future, wealthy people and certainly upper middle class or middle class, um, they will not own stuff, they will share and, and the future kind of a we may be driven more by experiences. What are some of the predictions? And I also wanted to ask you, in a, in a, at, a, at, a, at an age or point in time where there's so much information that people seem very good at ignoring facts and believing what they want to believe, and they, which of the trends that you highlight in the book um, was seen as, was resisted more or seen as kind of more controversial. For me, definitely was this idea that possessions are going to disappear. We're going to share everything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think this is a, a, a perhaps the best example. And uh, look, the sharing economy began, of course, with Uber, uh, with Airbnb, these types of platforms. And uh, look, um, it's very simple. Um, those of us who own a car, we only use it about uh, five or six percent of the time. So what's the point, right? And especially if we get to uh, the a moment in which we have uh, autonomous vehicles uh, without a driver, uh, electric vehicles, of course, then what's the point of owning a car if you ju can just uh, say, you know, I need a car and it will show up, right? Uh, but you would be sharing that with other people. Um, but I think it goes beyond that. So it's not just Uber or Airbnb. These are just the, uh, the beginning. Look, we have a big problem, Tomas, in the world, which is that we waste uh, a lot of food. Here in the United States, the U.S. Department of Agriculture estimates that 32-33% uh, of all of the food that reaches the end consumer 
gets wasted, ends up in the trash. And that is horrible when, as you know, we still have hunger here in the United States. But more importantly, agriculture is the single most important source of carbon emissions, right? So why are we producing more food than what we eat, right? Why do we waste a third of the food? And uh, so I think sharing platforms could help us address that problem. To avoid, for example, cans of food going bad, right? In my closet, in the kitchen, right? Uh, so sharing, I think, is, is beyond the concept of ownership, right? In the sense that, yes, we own the food, but we're gonna share it because maybe I need to buy this big of a can, but I only need half of it in order to prepare a meal. So the other half, I just throw it away, right? So, so maybe through sharing platforms, we could address that problem. And by the way, another one is clothes. The average American purchases 70 or 75 pieces of clothing per year. That's excessive, okay? Uh, most of those pieces of clothing, we only wear once or twice. And then we forget that we have them in the closet. I mean, this is pretty much what happens. So once again, why not share clothes? I know if it sounds like a kind of crazy, uh, especially in the middle of a pandemic, to say something like that. But I think uh, the sharing economy has huge potential. And as we have more AI and we have more robotics and all of that, think about so many things, right, that perhaps we won't need in the future in terms of owning them, though. rather we can share them. Uh, so I think that's going to be a really important part of our lives by the year 2030. Mm -hmm. What are some of the concerns? I mean, certainly, you know, there has we have seen also backlash um, against some uh, sharing economy or gig economy well, of course. structures. Of course. You know, the, of course, the, so. the, the job deal, the ethics, and you know, employee yeah. rights. Yeah, absolutely, and also uh, in the case of Uber, how you know it increases traffic in the cities, and in the case of Airbnb, that the neighbors complain that there's always visitors and all of that. So that's why I was arguing a moment ago that. The sharing economy is so much more than Uber and Airbnb, okay? I mean, most people think about Uber and Airbnb when they hear the term sharing economy. I think a true sharing economy would be one in which we become less wasteful, right, of resources. And remember, this is a key issue right now. I mean, we're polluting the world with plastics, right? Um, again, we are producing a lot of food that goes to waste, but at the same time, we still have hundreds of millions of people in the world, including some of them in the United States, who go hungry. Um, so I think the sharing economy is an opportunity for us to overcome the constraints of ownership so that we can truly unleash an economy that is friendly towards the environment, an economy that is truly sustainable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I should have invested in Bitcoin six or seven years ago. After reading your chapter, I see it's not too late. You're big on crypto. And I guess, you know, that's the other side or connected to the sharing economy. And the fact that maybe we will trust each other more than we trust institutions or financial systems. Uh, what can we expect for cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin in the next yeah. 10 years? Yeah, that's a great uh, topic. And uh, yes, I, I do believe that cryptocurrencies will proliferate in the future. Uh, however, as you know, the biggest obstacle right now is not the technology. We have the technology, right? Uh, the biggest obstacle is not entrepreneurship. Uh, we have plenty of startups that have entered this uh, space of cryptocurrencies. The problem is government regulation and central banks who don't want to lose control over the money supply. And of course, their arguments make a lot of uh, sense, right? I mean, in this pandemic, if it hadn't been for the Federal Reserve, we wouldn't have survived it, right? Um, so here's the thing. I think that governments, I think that central banks will accept cryptocurrencies if they are much more than just a substitute for money. I think that's the trick. I mean, I think the mistake um, that Bitcoin made was to try to compete against the currencies issued by governments. So I think uh, that's why in the book I talk about this um, concept of the digital token. I think that's what's going to proliferate, digital tokens. So digital tokens will include cryptocurrency but uh, that will only be one tiny component of them. The rest will be discount coupons, built-in incentives so that we are uh, more environmentally conscious in our consumption. It will be uh, a, a, a chip that will enable us to vote in elections so we can overcome all of the issues, right? That, uh, 
uh, it would be something that, that uh, those digital tokens that help us in a, engage in all types of transactions, even transactions that don't require the exchange of money, right? So I think digital tokens is the future. And one component of those digital tokens will be cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we already have today more currencies and countries, and uh, that trend will continue to accentuate. You also talk about Estonia as a case study of kind of a digital republic. Do you see even bigger countries moving that way and um, you know, going becoming tech republics or digital republics? Yeah, so Estonia is this Baltic Republic. Of course, it's a small country, very highly educated population. That's where Skype, uh, the uh, telecommunications uh, app, uh, emerged from. And uh, they have uh, set into motion a, an experiment that I think is just uh, amazing, right? Whereby pretty much everything is digitized to the point, by the way, Tomas, that they offer people from other countries what they call uh, digital citizenship in Estonia, right? So you can use their system, even if you're not a citizen of the country. But yeah, people vote uh, using this uh, digitized system. Uh, people can transact, uh, uh, and there's of course cryptocurrency involved. Uh, you see, it's interesting. Uh, so they, Estonia, decided to innovate here because they wanted to present themselves to the world as a digital republic, as a place where high tech would prosper. They wanted to attract investments. But you see, the other parts of the world where this kind of an approach has succeeded are not the rich parts of the world. So I would bring to your attention Kenya. Ghana in Africa, out of necessity, because they never had a fully developed banking system. They never had ATMs, uh, you know, at every corner in the street. They were forced to uh, use mobile payments and they are ahead of everyone else, right? So I think that either because of innovation or because of out of necessity, you need to develop this. I think we're gonna see more and more countries around the world embracing digital tokens, right? Mm -hmm. And this whole approach to transactions in the economy, but not only transactions. Let's not forget also what I mentioned earlier, building in incentives so that we all do the right thing. For example, that we are less wasteful of resources uh, or that uh, also, um, you know, incorporate uh, coupons, discount coupons, right? For purchasing certain things. Right now, as you know, you get them in the mail and then you have to cut them with scissors and then you take them to the store, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Increasingly that's happening on the phone but it could also be uh, implemented in the form of digital tokens. Yeah, I mean, I like, you know, you're big on nudging and the use of technology for nudging. I'm guessing you don't have to waste so much time on traffic lights now going from your home to the office, but uh, certainly small changes and reinforcing behaviors and yeah. to create new habits could be done. Let me ask you the final question, uh, Mauro. Is there anything that has surprised you about you know, humanity during these last eight or nine months? Because we all say, and you said it yourself, this is a pandemic that has mostly accelerated trends that were there. But is there anything that you know, has uh, surprised you? Or we say, wow, you know, this is not a, a direction or an event that I would have expected. Oh, several things. Uh, so one is how quickly we shut down the economy, right? Uh, perhaps too quickly, right? Given that uh, it is so much harder to restart it, right? So I thought the response was relatively swift. Unfortunately, of course, not everybody has been following the guidelines and that's why we continue to get um, uh, new cases and new hospitalizations and unfortunately new deaths. Uh, but it has surprised me, for example, how quickly some companies have pivoted, uh, right? Talking about Airbnb, uh, Airbnb is in the travel industry. As you know, the travel industry has been devastated. But Airbnb has the same revenue figure. It just went uh, 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 you IPO, know, uh, yeah. public yeah, this, uh, this week. Look, Airbnb realized that people wanted to get away from home but didn't want to fly. So they would want to drive for a couple of hours and stay not just for five days, but rather stay for a month or two. So they changed their algorithms. They changed their listings. And they've managed to pivot, right? Um, so that surprised me because I wasn't expecting Airbnb to do well under the circumstances. The other thing that has completely surprised me, quite frankly, has been the speed at which new medical treatments and new vaccines have been developed. And by the way, I think it has a lot to do with the human genome and with the big investments that we made in all of that. If you remember back in January, uh, the Chinese government made the genetic composition of the virus available to researchers around the world. And without that critical information and without the new knowledge that we have and the new technologies that we have, 
for understanding genetics and the genetic base of diseases and viruses and how they affect human beings and all of that, I don't think we would have been able to move so fast. So that also surprised me as to how those big investments that we made 20 years ago, now they're paying off big time, right? And then lastly, what else can I say? I'm surprised about something that you may find um, familiar, which is that education, for example, has long gone largely online as a result of this. We've been using these platforms now for the last few months as uh, instructors, mm -hmm. both of us. Look, the engagement on the part of my students is much greater, right? Uh, I'm getting more of them participate online than in the physical classroom, perhaps because the introverts feel less constrained. So uh, it's also a younger generation. They, they like the technology. So of course, we're going to go back to face-to-face -face learning and a lot of students need that. But I think the future, what has surprised me is that the future is going to be one in which I think these online platforms for learning are going to play a very important role. We're going towards blended education. And I kind of suspected that that would be the case, but it has surprised me the extent to which online learning has become popular as a result of this pandemic. Mm -hmm. It really has surprised me. Yep, yep. And you know, the, I guess the question we're all asking is uh, how rational are we going to be in general to not return to things that were not working and we have replaced mm -hmm. versus also, you know, the element that when you stop people from doing something they were doing, are they, you know, open minded enough? I mean, when you take something away from people, even if it's the right thing, they often want it back, right? Tra business travel to me is in that category. We probably shouldn't travel as much as we were, but yeah. so many business people are just itching to get back on a plane yeah. and yeah. travel. Yeah, I'm, I'm also, uh, you know, really, really hoping that I will be able to travel again soon because uh, this is completely against my own, you know, yes. nature and persona. Yeah, no. uh, but, you know, uh, the, the, the interesting thing here, Tomas, I think is that a pandemic such as this is a reset, right? So we had to reset our lives. And so now I think we should take this as an opportunity to organize ourselves in a way that is better than what we had before the pandemic. I think that that is the opportunity that is created by this pandemic. A reset is always a useful thing if we take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. Mauro, thank you so much for your time. Let me show the great book again, 2030. I'm sure people are still looking for Christmas presents or Santa Claus. If you need something for the list, here it is. I hope you don't have to, we don't have to wait uh, 10 years for the next book, if it's 2040, the sequels, or that you spend another six or seven years researching the next one. Uh, hopefully, you'll delight us with something sooner. But in the meantime, thank you for this fantastic piece of work and for sharing your ideas with us. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, Thomas, for having me on your show.